trust in the Lord and do good and you shall dwell in the land. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Come today, let us join together and worship the Lord. Welcome to our service here at Cornerstone Christian Church, Deception Bay. Welcome. Thank you. We're going to sing a well-known song. If you are sitting at home watching this through your TV or through the internet, you can join in with us. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. As we come to our time of church prayer, I want to take you through the Lord's Prayer and the introduction into the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, we read, But when you pray, do not use vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father in heaven knows what you need before you ask him. You should pray in this manner. 
And then we go into the Lord's Prayer. So let's not vainly repeat the Lord's Prayer today as so often we do. But let us use it as a pattern for our prayer. It begins, Our Father who art in heaven. And Father, we pray. Rather, we rejoice that you are our Father. That we are not without a family. That we belong to the family of God. And Father, as we get about our day, help us have the mindset of a small child. A child safe and secure in the shadow of his father, knowing that while his dad is there, no harm can come to him. Lord, you are on your throne in heaven. You are watching over us. And by your spirit, you are beside us, with us and within us. That we are not strangers in a faraway land without hope, without rescue, without help. But our Father, who is in heaven, is there with us. Our Father, who is in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Lord, let all we do and say bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, we live in a land, as Isaiah said. Oh Lord, we are undone. For we are a people of unclean lips and we dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. Daily we hear the name of Jesus being used as a curse word when that name is the most precious name. It is the name of your Son, our Saviour, who came and laid his life down to purchase our souls. What a precious name that is. Oh Lord, that we should be guilty of vainly bringing offence to others on the name of Jesus. Let that not be. Let us hallow your name. Let us keep it holy. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Lord, it is for that we look. The coming kingdom of Christ And that day when the trumpet shall sound and the angel shall shout and we shall be caught up into the clouds, the dead shall be raised. And we will be there forever and ever in your glory. Oh Lord, as your kingdom comes, let us not be a barrier to it, but let us be facilitators. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh Lord, that is our desire. That every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And Father, we say we want your will done. But too often we are guilty of asking you to use your magic to make our will happen. Oh, Lord, that is not what we're called for at all. And give us this day our daily bread. And, Lord, help us remember that Jesus said he is the bread of life and without him we have nothing. Oh, Lord, it is more than just nourishment for the body. We need nourishment for our souls We need nourishment for our hearts. We need nourishment for our spirit. Lord, sustain us, revive us, fill us anew. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Oh Lord, help us see 
that we are sinners dwelling in the midst of other sinners. Let us keep short account of what others have done against us. Lord, let us not delight in the sufferings of others. We don't delight in that. Lord, oh Lord, you know the pain we feel. Help us understand the pain you feel. How blessed is it when the brethren dwell together in unity. That is your word. Let it be our testimony. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Oh Lord, we live in a world that is filled with temptations. We cannot turn a corner or look at a screen without being enticed to buy, buy, take, enjoy, want, desire. And Lord, temptation begins with our eyes and what we allow our minds to think on. Oh, as the old preacher said, we cannot stop the birds flying over our head, but we can stop them making nests in our hair. Give us the strength. Give us the forethought. And give us your spirit that we would not set our hearts on the things of this world, but that we would set that upon the kingdom of God. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our Bible reading today is the Gospel of John. And in fact, uh, what we're looking at today is the whole of chapter 9. And uh, you may want to read all of it. I'm just going to read a couple of portions of it. We'll start at the beginning and I want to get the end. But there's a lot of stuff in the middle. Okay, and it begins. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered and he said, Neither has this man sinned, nor his parents, but the, the works of God should be made manifest in him. And I must manifest the works of him who sent me while it is day, for the night comes when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had spoken, he spat on the ground and he made clay from the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go and wash this into the pool of Siloam, which by interpretation is sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. And the neighbours, therefore, for they which before had seen him, knew that he was blind, said, Is this not he that sat and begged? And some said, This is he. And others said, No, he's just like him. But he said, I am he. We go down a bit further in the chapter and we find that uh, this man's now before the Pharisees. First of all, they bring his parents and his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Then again, they called the man that was blind and said to him, give glory to God and praise for we know this man is a sinner. And he answered, this is Jesus they're referring to, whether he be a sinner or not. I do not know. The one thing I know, whereas I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I told you already, yet you did not hear. Why would you ask it again? 
Are you also going to be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to us through Moses. As for this fellow, we don't even know him or where he is from. And the man answered and said to them, Why, here is a marvellous thing, that you know not where he comes from, and yet he's opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if any man be a worshipper of God and does his will, he hears him. And since the world began, it was not heard that any man's eyes were opened of him that was born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And they answered and they said to him, You were altogether born in sin. And now you teach us, and they cast him out. And when Jesus heard that they had cast him out, he went and found him and he said, Do you believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he that you are talking with now. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into the world, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be blind. And some of the Pharisees which were there with him heard these words, and they said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore, your sin remains. Hmm. It's an interesting passage. Let's begin at the end. Jesus said in verse 38 of chapter 9, I have come into this world for judgment, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Now I want to point out, That is a very passive form there. It's not saying they will, that the blind will see or that the seeing will become blind, but rather this is what can happen. And it happens because they are guilty of sin because they believed what was in their own eyes, but they refused to see the bigger picture of God. They chose the wisdom of themselves over the counsel of God. And this had been the battle of Israel for centuries. Back in the book of Judges, shortly before the time where Saul is appointed as king over Israel, we read in chapter 17 verse 6 and then in 18 verse 1, that there was no king in the land of Israel. And I'm going to stop right there because it was the intention of God that he should be the king, that Jesus was born to be the king of the Jews, that they had a divine king, an eternal king, but they did not see him. So they had no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. But in doing that, they did not do the will of the Lord. For they oppressed the people they were called to drive out of the land and forced them into service. That was their first mistake because there was more money in it. It made sense to them to do it. But then their children married the children of the people they were called to push out of the land, to drive out. And their generations began to take on the wisdom and the values of the sinful nation that they did, that they oppressed rather than pushed out. And then As the generations passed, they began to worship the idols 
of other nations. And they were doing what was right in their own eyes, but was an offence in the eyes of the Lord. They chose the wisdom of themselves over the counsel of God. Godless culture took over the hearts of their children and their grandchildren. That has been the sad story of human existence, not just Israel, but across the world. Now, let's go back and start chapter 9, now that we've finished it. (laughs) But I wanted to get you into that perspective. I want to start with the very first verse. And it's one of those little verses that I think sometimes we miss You know, it's just sort of setting the scene, we think, and, ah, you know, this is just getting into it. We want to get into the words of Jesus. We want to get into the things that Jesus is doing. And we miss sometimes the most incredible things. And verse 1 is absolutely riveting. It says, And Jesus passed by, and he saw a man that was born blind from sin. And you go, What are you getting out of that, Peter, that we're not getting, right? Well, I'm going to tell you. Divine appointments are never written into our daily planners. God has things for us in life that we don't put into our phones and into our computer diaries or right onto our calendars on the wall. We are just going through life. And we have what we think are chance encounters with people. But I want to tell you that these encounters are written in the annals of heaven long before we are born. These are divine appointments. Jesus was just passing by. The disciples were just passing by. The beggar man was just sitting there because he sat there and yesterday he sat there and the day before he sat there and next week he thought he would be sitting there, Lord willing, No one thought this moment was special. But long before that man had been born, God had set that day in eternity. And I want you to know that there will be times when we're going down the street and we'll just bump into somebody We'll be going about our business as we did the day before and as we would plan to do tomorrow. And there, unexpected, unknown to us, will be divine appointments. Appointments set before time that will last and bear fruit into eternity. Oh, wow. Could you imagine? One day... I hope I will bump into this blind man in heaven and he will say, thank you, you told my story. And he will look at me and he will say, because you preached on this, son, others came to learn the lesson that God wrote in me. Wow. Now, let's move on a little bit. They're going past and the disciples look around and go, ah, look at that, blind man over there. Was he the sinner or was it his parents that sinned? That is a delusion that has plagued every human heart that I have ever met. You go, huh, no, I don't think so. Yes, Yes. How many people are deluded into thinking that their circumstances are either devoid of God or deluded into thinking that their circumstances are a punishment from God or deluded into thinking that God doesn't think much of them 
as he thinks of that other person. And this is nothing new. When John Wesley was touched and his heart was strangely warmed, not soon after he stood on his father's grave and he preached in the fields and the miners came for miles around and thousands would listen. And they said that as they heard Mr. Wesley preach, the tears would roll down their cheeks creating rivers of white on soot-blackened faces. These men had been growing up believing that they were cursed of God. There was no place in the church for them. There was no baptism for them. There was no anything for them in the church because they were sinners. It was obvious because they were nothing more than animals that you sent down into the dirt to dig out the coal to keep those that God had blessed warm. And so they would crawl into the holes of the earth. They would dig out the coal and they would come out cursing and pour their money into a publican's hand. It was said that for a shilling you could get enough drink, enough gin, to make a man drunk. Was it a shilling or a penny? It was a penny. For one penny, you could get all the gin you could drink. These people had been taught that there was no hope for them, that they were obviously sinners because they were born of the wrong parents in the wrong place at the wrong time. And in the same land of a Sunday, there would be people of wealth, and position, who would sit in the small churches of England, puffing themselves up with pride, believing that they were chosen of God, and that was evidenced by their high position in society. Wow. I want to tell you what Jesus said is true. Neither you nor your parents sinned that you were born into your circumstances. But rather, your life was there to manifest the glory of God. Let me explain that to you. Each of us, there are six billion people or seven billion people, I don't know, we keep getting more, around the world, canvases, on which God desires to paint a portrait of grace. And he wants to paint portraits of grace in villages, in jungles. He wants to paint portraits of grace in the ghettos of China. He wants to paint portraits of grace in the suburbs of Brisbane. He wants to paint portraits of grace in your home, in your life, in your setting. Your circumstances are not evidence of God's pleasure or displeasure, but rather they are the opportunity that was given to you to manifest the glory of God in your life. Okay. Let's move on. Christ is the light of the world. He says that in verse 5. I have work to do. This is verse 4. Works of him who sent me. In other words, Jesus was about his father's business. I must work while it is day because the night comes and when it is night, no one can work. I want to tell you, for many years I worked as a motor mechanic. And on days like today, we were desperate for light. Here it is, it's a cloudy winter's day. The sun is low, the clouds are plenty, and the light is scarce. And we would get our old lead lights and shove them up into engine bays and we're going, I can't see. 
And we keep moving the light around until we could see. We could see what it was that was broken. We could see what it was to be mended. Because without that light, we were working in darkness. We were working in blindness. And our work was without purpose. Christ is the light of the world in that he shows us who we are, in that he shows us where we ought to be going. He is the light of the world in that he shows us what we need. He shows us what we should be doing. And only in his light can we see the problems, can we see the remedies, can we see what needs to be done. It's interesting because a few chapters on, we have the Last Supper. And in John chapter 13, verse 30, as they're eating, and Jesus shares the bread with Judas and he dips his sop in and agrees to go. And he leaves that supper. He heads out on his own. The other disciples think he's going to get some more bread. Thought, oh, obviously we're running a bit low on bread. Judas has gone to get more bread. No, he went to betray Jesus and to bring the troops back to arrest him. And in John chapter 30, 13 verse 30, it says, And Judas dipped his sop and went out and it was night. It was dark. Judas brought in the darkness. From that point on, Jesus did no more miracles. He healed no more sick. He gave sight to no more blind. He gave legs to no more lame. He did not cast out any more demons, but rather he went to the garden. He prayed. He was arrested. He was beaten. He took upon himself our affirmities and he died on that cross. It was the end of his ministry. The night had come. John chapter 13, verse 30. Okay, so he goes and makes this little paste up, you know. Spits in the ground, grabs a bit of dirt and spits into it and rubs it around with his finger and sticks it in this guy's face. Hmm. Never been to a doctor like that? Don't plan to. Now, actually, I do plan to. I, I want Jesus as my doctor. But boy, that just does not sound right. And he says, go, wash it into the pool. Get rid of it. And for years I wondered about that. What was the point of that? He could have said, you know, yeah, I want you to be blind. You know, there you go, you can see. But no, the guy has to wash the dirt out of his eyes to be able to see. And I'm mulling that over in my mind. The guy had to wash the dirt out of his eyes to be able to see. Oh, yeah, of course, that makes sense, doesn't it? That is what we need. We cannot see Jesus we cannot see the kingdom of God while we have the grime and filth of this world filling our eyes. We have to wash the filth of this world out of our vision before we will see Jesus. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yeah. But now he was opposed by a religion that was Christless. It was a real religion that was based on human works. And they sat back there and they made their judgments. And I want to tell you that when you get amongst religious people who are Christless, they're very good at being judgmental. They are. And they say, oh, this can't be of God. Because it doesn't make sense to us. We don't understand it. 
It can't be of God. It can't be of God because we can't control it. And we're the religious leaders, so it has to happen through us. Therefore, if this is happening and we're not controlling it, that's not of God. It can't be of God because it doesn't fit our rules. What? He's making someone healthy on a Sabbath? Oh, God forbid, you can't make someone healthy on a Sabbath. That doesn't fit with our rules. Religion that is Christless is small-minded. And it turns nasty when it has no answers. And I want to take you back to our reading that we had earlier. Back in uh, verse 28. Then they reviled him and said to him, You're his disciple, but we're Moses' disciples. Religion that is Christless does not seek understanding, but condemns those that will not join it in its rejection of doing the will of God. Religion that is Christless rejects those who believe. That is sad truth. They cast him out. We've got no room for you because you don't fit into our thinking. We have no room for you because we can't control you. We have no room for you because you don't make sense to us. So you have to get out because we've got things nice. We like it this way and you're messing our nice up. Get out. That is religion that is Christless. That is what they did to that man that day. But I want to tell you that a Christ-centered religion sees the hand of God. It sees the way of God and it sees the provision of God. I remember as a young man, I went and visited uh, the training college of the Mission Society, WEC. Uh, used to be worldwide evangelization crusade, but then as they were moving into Muslim nations, the word crusade was sort of, yeah, it didn't really fit that well, so they called it uh, the Worldwide Evangelization uh, Commission, I think, or Council. But WEC. And they have their training centre down in St. Leonard's, which is a suburb of Launceston in Tasmania. And on the wall, when I was there, was written these words, and it was a quote from one of their members, and it said... The existence of a need is the evidence of God's intention to supply. When they saw a need, they got on their knees and gave glory to God because they knew they needed a miracle and they knew the God they served was the God of miracles. I want to finish with the shepherdless psalm. That's right, the shepherdless psalm. It's not the shepherd psalm. We all know the shepherd psalm, the 23rd psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, etc. Well, this is a, yeah, this is the shepherdless psalm. What you get when you cut Christ out of your life. And it goes like this. I am my own shepherd. I worry about my bank balance. I work hard to fill my pantry and collapse exhausted into bed. My soul is weary from worry and fear and I choose the paths that seem right to me. I dread the thought of living through troublesome times. Evil surrounds me and I feel so alone. My faith brings me so little comfort. My table is constantly robbed by my foes and my life is anointed with tears. My cup overflows. Surely worry and strife will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in my house with unending anguish. Hmm. 
I don't want to leave it there. Let's go back to the psalm with the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my foes. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That only happens when we open our eyes of faith. Amen. We're going to finish today with a, a song that's over 60 years old in the light of the challenge that we've heard today about looking unto Jesus there's nothing worse than blindness I couldn't imagine what it would be like to be blind but I think having eyes and yet still being spiritually blind is probably a more challenging thing to face and I know that in our world today there are millions on our planet that spiritually are blind Many sit in churches and they can't see the one who was sent to take away all the anguish and the pain. There are plenty today sitting in churches and outside of churches that are filled with bitterness, unforgiveness, sickness and pain. And yet the Bible exhorts us and encourages us to look unto Jesus, the one that initiated our faith and the one that wants to complete us. So the song we're going to sing today is an old, old song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And I know if you know this song or listen to the words of this song as we sing it, God can heal every broken heart. He can break the chains around your life. If you're sitting in bitterness today, Jesus can take all the bitterness away. If you're sitting in unforgiveness today or hurt or grieving, Jesus can take all the hurt away. You're grieving over your children, your family, your loved ones, or you have problems in your family. Looking unto Jesus is the only answer. There is no other answer. So today I just want to challenge you as we sing the song for you to turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. And the words say, And the things of earth will grow strangely dim once you see the light of his glory and grace. upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace O soul are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Up 
upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into Dominion for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strange. glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying. His perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light glory and grace in the light of his glory and grace indeed turn your eyes to Jesus and look fully into his glorious face and allow those things that trouble those around you disappear in his glory and his grace. Go forward in that grace. Go forward in that glory. Go forward into that week in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless. Have a great week. Thank you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow straight. Oh